everyone, and welcome back to the Game Nexus. It's Dwayne here, and today we're going to be talking a little bit about Dungeons & Dragons world building. So over the years of playing D&D, um, all the way to when I was 12 years old, just starting to learn Dungeons & Dragons, the greater concept of our games was what's out there in the world. Uh, what else is happening in this massive D&D world besides our small group of adventures going into a dungeon and uh, killing monsters and getting treasure? It wasn't until early on uh, that the Dungeon Master, that uh, my friend and Dungeon Master, sort of pulled out this massive, uh, mind-blowing map, and it was the world of Greyhawk. Um, and this was a uh, an expansion for Dungeons & Dragons first edition at the time, and it was essentially just this massive world, and our, our collective minds were blown. Like, we literally looked to him and said, you mean we can actually go there it was hex based of course you know and we weren't used to using maps in our games it was all theater of the mind for the most part so to be able to see this greater world and in detail nonetheless uh, in full color just trigger our imaginations and we started you know planning these grandiose journeys across the realm and wanting to take over this for ourselves etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, suffice to say, uh, we never did really explore Greyhawk, but it was nice to see the uh, overarching world that our adventures were taking place in. So whenever we did a new module or we did a new adventure, uh, our dungeon master would actually go and point to specific areas that we were actually in. Um, I don't remember much about how we traversed the world um, during those early days of D&D, but um, it was nice to have sort of a context uh, to what was happening. So later on, uh, as I grew older, <clears throat> uh, TSR, then TSR, um, was actually expanding their world. And uh, the Forgotten Realms was the first world set that they created. Uh, and again, to frame all of these ongoing modules and adventures that they were going to be doing. Uh, eventually um, became a series of novels set in the Forgotten Realms. And I think even today, Forgotten Realms is sort of the de facto standard uh, when you look at things like Neverwinter and the, the Dark Elf series with Drew Stewart and um, even all the way up to the new video games with Dark Alliance. So the Forgotten Realms haven't gone away. Um, and again, for me, it was it was just this massive world. And and I think what happened probably in my mid twenties is I start to I started to feel like the world was bigger than what I could handle. Um, there was all this pre-established lore. I was trying to keep up with it um, for my player's sake and for my sake. I kind of had this feeling that if I was going to use the Forgotten Realms as my setting, um, I would be remiss if I wasn't the expert on the Forgotten Realms. Um, so anytime anything happened in it, and of course my friends started challenging me as well, saying, you know, I read the book and this happened. When is our campaign taking place? Did this already happen? I want to bump into so-and-so. If I go here, chances are I'll see this. So it, it almost became, rather than sort of this uh, opening up of my uh, gaming, it became sort of the, these walls that were closing in around me because I had to adhere to what TSR or Wizards eventually um, had written and had established as lore. So I think around my 20s is when I started to, to gravitate away from established game worlds, only because I, I just felt that my creativity on my own was more free. So I just basically said, you know, I'm not going to worry about their game world. My game world will take place in a generic world. Uh, and that's sort of the first step. That got me through quite a few sessions. And I think for the most part, your average players um, don't necessarily need a, a larger framework to put their adventures into context. You know, and I don't talk to a lot of dungeon masters, but I find that um, unless the story requires this overarching world to be involved in their individual um, dungeon romps or wilderness romps, it's probably not something that most dungeon masters are really going to have to worry about or really even want to put a lot of time into thinking. Um, not until about two years ago, uh, two to three years ago, it, uh, it came to my attention yet again is that I was going to be needing to create that. And the reason for it is I embarked on a journey of becoming a professional dungeon master. I then started earning a living um, dungeon mastering games. And it became clear that if I was doing more than one game session, I would need a sort of a continuity that flowed throughout these, these uh, sessions. So <clears throat> I was running four Dungeons & Dragons sessions a week. And I had different adventures in each session. So it wasn't it was different groups. And I wanted their sessions to have some glue that binded them all together. If they weren't able to play together, I wanted this sort of to take place in the same world. Sort of like the Marvel Cinematic Universe, if you will. So I set about creating this world. And it was a daunting task at first. And I said to myself, how am I going to do this? And so one path that Dungeon Masters can take, and I've talked to a lot who have gone this path, is you can dedicate hours and hours of your 
life to just creating this framework, this game world um, right out of the gate. Uh, sort of like a box product, if you will, from what you know, Wizards of the Coast would make a game world. And that requires a lot of work. You're going to have to spend hours creating characters, creating lands, creating rules, um, and then finding out where your players fit into all this. And that's one way to go. And if you are somebody who enjoys that process, it's absolutely a great way to go. Myself, um, I am more of an evolving creative mind. So um, I take what comes at me as far as creative uh, feedback, and I take that and I kind of ball it up into a creation and then throw it back out into the world. Um, so for me, what I did is I created a template. Uh, what I did is I created a world called The Realm. Um, it's not the most original name, um, but it suited my needs. I drew a squiggly little map uh, on a piece of paper and uh, I started plunking down sort of fantasy basics that I knew I would want to have, uh, if you will, biomes, much like a video game. I said I knew I wanted some mountains. I knew I wanted a cold region, a forest region, a desert region, a swampy region. And I was just sort of piecing these together where I wanted them and then slapped some names on these regions, not, not intending that my players would actually need more information than that, but it served as a sort of a, a basic map for my world. Um, and then, then at that point, I said, okay, well, I, I need these players to sort of focus on these areas. So I was very clever in that I made it so that the four campaign groups were actually in four different areas. Um, that allowed me to stretch my creative freedoms as well. I didn't want to burn out. So I wanted each session to have its own unique um, creative uh, elements for me so that I didn't have to just do the same campaign setting day in and day out, four days a week. Um, so for me, that was sort of the first step. What I'm going to do today is I'm going to propose to Dungeon Masters who are thinking about creating their own world one way to go about doing this. And it's not the best way necessarily for you, but the way that I took as a path. So I am a person who usually will build from the inside out. And what that means is I'll focus on the small and grow to the big. Um, there is a school of thought where um, people say, let's create from the big and dial down to the small. Um, so for me, everything starts with the players. Uh, that is the most important thing that a uh, new Dungeon Master can focus on when building their world. So allow that process to take place. Uh, your day one scenario, or your day one session, your day zero session, what they call it. Um, allow the players to create their characters. Uh, arrive at the table with that general sense of what your world will contain, but don't necessarily reveal or throw everything at the players. Allow them the creative freedom to go ahead and build these characters, just knowing that there's going to be your typical fantasy tropes, whether that be forests and, and dungeons and all those kinds of areas, right? Allow that to flow freely. As that process starts to happen and during that process, you can start in your mind figuring out, ah, this is where I can see this happening. This is where I can see this happening. But again, not needing any concrete details. I'll give you an example. Um, I have an elven player in my campaign and together me and the player decided that this uh, character would hail from a kingdom um, with elves, but that kingdom would just sort of be out there. We hadn't really mapped out any details about it, but it would be out there, something that we could tackle at a later date to flesh out. Uh, to flesh out. Um, because it didn't really have any bearing on the story per se at the moment. Um, this character wasn't living in that kingdom. So we just kind of put it out there. Well, as luck would have it in my most recent campaign, I'm actually going back and we're going to be fleshing out that region uh, with more details. We're going um, now from the bigger down to the smaller. Um, but it all started with the character. Um, so it started with that one character throwaway line that they came from this area. And that allowed me to sort of park that for a while. And that's been a couple of years now. So um, just one example of how you can take a, a small thing like that and expand it at a later date. It doesn't need to be all fleshed out right off the bat. So after the player has created their character, you can work with the player to come up with some names, um, some backstory. And this is where you then can start taking it and running with it. The player has given you some basics. And, and whether that be just, he's a barbarian. Okay, and you can say to your player, well, great, you're a barbarian. What kind of barbarian are you? Do you hail from a desert? Do you hail from a winter area? And they say, well, I kind of want to be like a winter barbarian with a big beard and cloak and a fur cloak. Great. So they've just given you something to run with. You now know that you need to flesh out a little bit of information about this snowy area that your barbarian player came from. And so on and so on with each player. Going a step further, you then look at where is my initial session going to take place? Okay, and you spread out your canvas in front of you and you have this world map and you say, okay, well, I want some dungeon adventuring or I want some forest adventuring or I want some city adventuring. 
that's when you can go back and say, okay, where do I want this to take place? Well, maybe I want this to take place in that barbarian's homeland. Maybe that's an area that we're going to explore right off the bat instead of worrying about dealing with it later. So create your town. Create the name of this small little town in this sort of biome of winter and mountains, etc. Create a couple dungeon areas. Maybe flesh out that small area of the game world that you know is going to be important to the players right off the bat. Don't worry about the rest of it. It's out there. You'll get to it. Um, so those are some examples of how I'm sort of approaching world building with my campaign. Uh, I'm going to leave this video on one final note uh, and an example. In my campaign world, the realm, there is an island called the Lost Isle. And again, I don't reinvent the wheel when it comes to names. Um, the Lost Isle, in my mind, was just a generic sort of untamed wilderness jungle island. And I knew I wanted dinosaurs in my game world, so I said, going to be a dinosaur island. Um, in actual fact, I pulled it from inspiration that I had as a child on a module called the Isle of Dread. It was a basic D&D module. It may have been an advanced D&D module. But it was basically this tribal island, this jungle island, lost world type concept with dinosaurs. And being a big uh, lover of dinosaurs as a kid, I, it was awesome. I never played that adventure um, because my skills at the time weren't good enough to run a full open world sandbox D&D uh, &D adventure. Uh, most recently, I had my players go to my lost world, which is an island in my game world. And I actually got to finally, after decades, live out my dream of running my players through a dinosaur-themed uh, campaign series. Well, as luck would have it, uh, I have a new group of players who are wanting to start their campaign in the Lost Isle. Um, they've seen my game world map, and that area took on a particular interest for them. So I'm going back to the Lost Isle. But now I have an opportunity to flesh that area out even more rather than just being sort of an area that they visit. This is going to be a starting point for some new characters. So to me, I'm now taking my own uh, advice and I'm going to start fleshing out, starting with a basic premise of just this aisle. And now I can build my miniature campaign world around the Lost Isle. So it's very exciting for me. Um, these techniques, again, aren't going to be for everybody, uh, these tips, these ideas, but um, I'm hoping that I can give you guys a little bit of insight into how my brain works when it comes to crafting D&D stories. And uh, I get to play with dinosaurs again, so how cool is that? See you on the table.